if you permit these infinite universe cosmologies, you also have this situation where anything can happen for any reason at all in some possible universe, and it ends up resulting in science destroying consequences because you can't rely on the uniformity of nature, you can't make predictions, you can't make explanations, and you end up with Boltzmann brains. So um, I don't know if Steinhardt agrees with that, but it's yep. that's one of the problems it with those cosmologies. It destroys, exactly, Steve. It destroys the testability. It destroys the meaning of the probabilistic measure that you can assign. It's not even clear what probability means in a multiverse. You know, what are the odds of an event happening? How do you define an ensemble? What is the notion of philosophy? Here's an issue, maybe, Justin, for another time to discuss with Stephen. Uh, but what would, if you have an infinite number of universes, um, and not only are the laws of nature have to be finely tuned in the parameters, the speed of light, the strength of gravity, but why not the laws of logic? Why not the laws of mathematics? Could they vary from universe to universe? Could modus tollens? Could modus ponens? Could all these laws vary from universe to universe? But that's not Paul's objection um, you know, a priori. His objection is simply that you can't make any predictions in a multiverse, and anything you get could be consistent with some other particular set of laws or set of laws of physics or laws of law. So that's his objection. Uh, Sir Roger Penrose has, uh, has, has called the fine-tuning issue and the, and the very low entropy state configuration that Stephen talks about in The Return of the God Hypothesis. He calls that fantasy. And he calls that, and again, he's one of the originators of, of the singular uh, theorems with Stephen Hawking, the late, great Stephen Hawking. So these men, not only though, the reason I want to point them out is they don't only assail with slings and arrows from the sidelines. They have constructed theories, rival theories to the inflationary universe that not only solve the problems of cosmic structure formation depicted on this, uh, on this very, uh, very comely beach ball that I'm holding up here, very colorful, uh, but they also they also um, provide a test, a crisp test to falsify themselves. In other words, they have a mechanism by which they can be proven wrong. Whereas we just established that the inflationary theory can not only not be proven right, it may not be able to be proven wrong because not observing the inflationary uh, signatures is not necessarily refutation of the multiverse or of the inflationary theory itself. So both Steinhardt and the Penrose theory have testable consequences, and they both happen to be related to the theory mm. of cosmic microwave yeah. background polarization that is my team's specialty. Yeah, I, I mean, just briefly, Steve, some commentary on those alternative theories um, and right. whether or not uh, they well, have an implicate, any, any, anything to say to the, the God yeah. hypothesis itself. Yeah, I certainly don't think they refute it. Um, in um, Penrose's model, uh, in fact, both of these these models involve they're, they're cyclical models where you get multiple universes generating over time. And um, back in the 1980s, when the oscillating universe, which was a kind of precursor to these ways of thinking, was popular, Alan Guth showed that you know with the, whatever is causing the expansion of the universe, the process of expansion is generating disorder and entropy. If you think of blowing a lot of energy through a system, you're going to get a lot of disorder. So if you want to get another cycle out of that, you've got to find some way of resetting the entropy to a lower level, but just making things more orderly again so that you have more energy available to do work. And in both of these new models, this is still a problem. Um, in the Penrose model, you have the universe expanding for a long time. And out of a very old universe, you get a, a, a new universe arising. And he posits a field called, which he calls the phantom field, that he alleges is capable of making that crossover from our sort of the dying embers of our universe to a new one. But it has almost godlike properties. And another uh, one of his colleagues at Oxford, um, Julian Barber, has commented on this and said, "There's no th this type of field has no analog in any known physics because it operates only in a particular time and in a particular space." And it has the ability to reset entropy, and it has the ability to initiate a dramatic change of state. Um, in other words, it sounds more like a mind than a physical field. And so it's a really interesting proposal, and I'm, I'm really always open to evaluating and looking at new such proposals. And it may end up being testable, as Brian says. But the, the, um, the mechanism that he proposes at this point is, somewhat, is, is more than speculative, and it has these properties that are contrary to our uniform and repeated experience of physics itself. We don't know of physical processes that can spontaneously, at just the right time and just the right place, reduce entropy, increase order, and generate 
a whole new changes of state. And the Steinhardt model also has this same difficulty. So different, he has the, the new universes arising at, at, more at the beginning of the, after a big crunch. And he also requires a, a universe, a, a, an entropy setting, uh, resetting mechanism. And he acknowledges that, that it would involve novel um, interactions between the different physical fields. So that it's at this point, there's not a lot of specificity yeah. there. So, so I'm not sure it's yet testable, but it, yeah. it's an, at so, least an so attempt in, to solve the sense, problem. Wh whether it's the kind of inflationary model or a kind of, you know, mathematical model or one of these other models for you none of them seem to be able to escape the, the need for some sort of information uh and to, you know to, to, well, to make and, it work and the penrose interesting the penrose model has exactly the same character as these quantum cosmological models in the sense that his his phantom field is a purely mathematical entity that suddenly transforms into a physical entity without explanation so you go from again from math to matter and I think that's inconsistent with what we know physics does. Math is a conceptual reality. So his, his, uh, it's interesting to me that the, the, the kind of mechanism that he ends up inventing to make that crossover has godlike properties. And it, it can reduce entropy. It's immaterial initially. It operates only at a particular time and in a particular place. And it can generate a change of state at that time and place. As, as a mind could do by making a choice. So to me, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it might be, it's certainly worth exploring, but it seems to me to kind of reinforce the need for a God hypothesis because of the causal profile he's painting of the necessary, the entity that he posits, which would be necessary to explain a new universe arising has attributes that are more like agency than like matter. Quick, quick response, Brian, and then we'll go to a break and we'll we'll try and fit in something on fine tuning as well. But yeah, go for it. Yeah, I I, I tend to agree with Steve. The the only uh, slight you know kind of uh, tweak to it is I would say that they might not be um, philosophically or mathematically fully fleshed out, but they're currently falsifiable. In other words, uh, we can currently or imminently with tools like. My colleagues and I are building on the high Atacama Desert at 17,000 feet above sea level, the Simons Observatory, funded hmm. by the Simons Foundation. We, if we observe the so-called twisting, curling pattern of microwave polarization that I describe in losing the Nobel Prize as B-mode polarization, that will be the death knell uh, for Paul Steinhardt's model. And he candidly admits that. Uh, that would invalidate and uh, eviscerate his model. So although the underpinnings of it uh, are not fully fleshed out, of, of course, you have to look at the sociology of science. It's a sociological field. Uh, it, even if you know some argue that sociology is not a science, but there's still a sociology within science. And there's a, a tremendous amount of energy that goes into fields like string theory, and inflation and very little that goes into alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so it's remarkable how much uh, he has extracted from this incipient you know, theory of him and, and very few others like Neil Turok and Anna Aegis, uh, but almost very few others have really picked up that mantle. And yet we can perhaps prove it wrong within a few years uh, with tech tools and technology that my colleagues uh, are building currently and then and will be deploying. That's fascinating. So, and bully for the experimentalists in this that actually can yeah. hold feet to the fire with some of these theories and say, right. do they work or not? Yeah, that's great.